Well, good morning and welcome to worship at First Methodist Church of Alexandria. We're so delighted you're here. If you haven't already done so, if you'd grab the, the few pads and sign in, we promise not to harass, stalk, or bother you, uh, but we will probably say hello, welcome, and thanks. And so we do on this morning say welcome and thanks, especially to our guests. Our uh, pastor, lead pastor, R.L., is out this morning with some family opportunities and needs, and we'll say more about that during our prayer time this morning. The Bible, Scripture, is not full of model families. You've got Cain killing Abel. David had all kind of drama with his family, like multiple kids and multiple generations on top of the affair that he had. And then, well, there's Abraham. And we'll talk a little bit about his family story later on in worship today. Family's wonderful, but then it's a struggle. Parenting is great, but then there's hard days, right? We pray for our children and we pray with our children. Many of you have birthed and nursed children. We talk with them, pray with them, teach them, guide them, lead them along the way. And then the day comes when we look at them and we say, I recognize you. I know you're my offspring. I know you're my flesh and blood and I do love you, but I don't recognize you at all. Some alien has taken possession of my child's body, and I want my child back. So that's a little bit of what we're talking about today as we continue our series of The Struggle is Real. And we hope that it's an enriching, life-giving day for you. But I do assure you that the days do get better. Talk to someone who has graduated their child from high school or sent them on into their college and career career years, and you will hear stories of, yes, there were those months or years that I thought, what in the world is going on? But we became friends again, and we made it through those challenging days. Please join me in the call to worship, found in your uh, worship guide. The Lord hears our cries in times of struggle. God will not turn away from us. Let the Lord lift our spirits like shade from a tree. May he quench our thirst with his living water. Amen. Please stand now for our opening hymn, When Love is Found, uh, hymn number 643.
please join me in our affirmation of faith. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. to invite Emily and the children to come down for a children's moment now. Good morning. Um, I'd like to start by saying when I texted RL yesterday and asked what we were talking about and she said parenting, I said, oh shoot. <laughs> Um, but I have a really great story, and I've been saving it for a children's sermon, and it's today, okay? Because a lot of the people here know the person the story is about. Her name was Hope Norman, Hope Johns Norman, my bad, and that was my grandmother, and she would tell us the story all the time when we were little. Her dad was a Methodist minister, and she did something mischievous when she was little. I can't even imagine it, but she did. And he made her copy out of the Bible over and over again, honor your father and mother, over and over and over again. She had to write it. But she also copied, honor your father and mother, but parents, do not provoke your children. <laughs> which is the second part of the verse. So um, she really uh, got her dad good like that, right? Because she was throwing back some scripture at him after he was trying to get her with the scripture. But I want you to think about that for a second. Yes, it is your parents' job to take care of you, right? That's their job, okay? Now, is it your job to listen to them? Yeah, for sure, right? But it's also their job to take care of you, and that's hard for us to do sometimes. Do you ever realize that? It's, it's not easy, okay? Like, think, think about something your parents have taught you. Should be pretty easy. What's something your mom or dad have taught you? A lot of things. Name one. Oh, God. Anything? My dad taught me how to change the oil in my car. Change the oil? Yeah, not change it. Check it, my bad. <laughs> not change it. Check it. Um, my mom taught me how to cook lots of things. Thomas, your dad teaches you how to play cards? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Play cards. <laughs> and he could make up the rules, couldn't he? Yeah. You have to trust him that he's given you the right rules. So we have to trust our parents just like we trust God to guide us too. So I want you to think about that, about how it's a hard struggle for your parents to teach you and guide you. And sometimes they're going to make mistakes. You got to help them and not, not provoke them. All right, no, we can't provoke you, right? You got to honor us, though. It's a double, it works both ways. That's the message today. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for giving us our parents. Help them guide us. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Emily. Have fun, kids. Throughout the Bible, we hear stories of 
different people's struggles and how people try to relate to God, how people are moved by God and changed by God. And when you read these stories in the Bible, um, you know, some things have changed since then. We have more technology. Uh, You might have cell phones in the mix now. But what's cool is people haven't changed all that much. And the good news is God hasn't changed either. The God we serve does not change. He loves you and me just as much as the people in the Bible. And in the story that we're going to hear today, full of its troubles, God still did good things in people's lives, and that's because he is faithful. And for that, we are grateful. So today, let's all lift up families. We all know a family that is struggling, that might need guidance. Maybe it's our own. Maybe it's a friend or neighbor. But let's all lift up the, the family today. Because when God gets involved in the family, um, suddenly there's a chance that it'll all work out. Let us pray. God, when the troubles of our hearts are many... You are still faithful when we grow tired, when we feel overwhelmed, when we get burnt out, when we are grieving. Your love still covers us, Lord, and for that, we are truly thankful. We thank you for your kindness and the mercy you show us every day. Your mercies never cease, and your steadfast love endures forever. Because you are great, and great is your faithfulness. And Jesus, we ask that you increase our faith. Help us to walk with you so that we can persevere these challenges and walk with you. And we ask that you increase our love for you and our love for our families. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you, choir and Elizabeth, for a beautiful centering moment in our worship this morning. As we pray this morning, we are mindful of Rusty Bethley. Uh, he begins radiation uh, treatment tomorrow for a course of six weeks. We also have others who are battling cancer, and they're in various stages of treatment and recovery with that. Uh, Billy Slaughter, as you may know, uh, had a stroke and is recovering at home. Uh, Sylvia Musterman's uh, mom, uh, Sylvia works her nursery and grip here. Uh, her mom's facing some end of life uh, uh, matters at home, so we're in prayer for her and Sylvia and her family. Um, we grieve the death and loss of Margaret Campbell. Uh, those services are pending. Uh, and we also grieve the death and loss of Jack Douglas Jr. Uh, Jack's services and celebration of life were yesterday. He's the grandfather of Addie Brower, who worships with us and goes on youth trips with us from time to time. Today is Nancy Owens' birthday, and we are grateful and celebrating alongside our friend for another year of life. It's also the birthday for Monroe Bell Garden, Brady Smart. So please join me in prayer. Gracious God, we are grateful for you and your love and your light that guides us and calls us. We've been walking through several topics that help remind us just how precious and challenging life can be and how much we are in need of you. The struggles of life are real, but the love, grace, and joy that you offer us is remarkable and outstanding. So as we continue in this moment of worship and feel your presence in spirit, call out to us, guide and comfort all those we have named and all those on our heart. Whether we know them by name or not, we know that they are in need of your love and grace. And we ask that you help us to do our part through all of it. And now we offer these words that your son taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture passage comes from Genesis 21, beginning in verse 8. We're picking up part of the family history of Abraham here. The child grew and was weaned, and on the day Isaac was weaned, Abraham held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Abram... Uh, I'm sorry, but Sarah saw the son whom Abram, the Egypt, Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, get rid of that slave woman and her son, for that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, do not be so dis distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also, because he is your offspring. So early the next morning, Abraham took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He sent them on her shoulders, set them on her shoulders, and then sent her on, off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the de desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down, about a bow shot away, for she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God called to, Ab called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. 
So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. May God add the blessings to the reading and hearing of his word. It's 6.17 in the evening and you're just getting home from the day. You picked up one child on your way home from work, a day that took much and gave little. Supper is yet to hit the table. There's no leftovers to be found, and you've had pizza way too much that week already. It's just you and the one child at the moment. Your spouse hasn't made it home yet. Two of the kids had soccer practices in different parts of town. And your child who you brought home wishes she'd never gone to school that day. The challenges were, the day for, were much for the day, too, for her. The house is quiet, but between the pots and pans, the running water, and the occasional popping of grease, you hear the sound of your child crying. You ask what's wrong. Silence. You try to hold her, and she rejects the embrace and the listening ear you've offered. I'm okay, she exclaims. I just want to be left alone. Your heart tells you she needs you. You catch a whiff of supper. Hot water sizzles against the stove eye. A faint odor of something wafts down the hall. You hurry back to the kitchen just as the smoke detector beeps. You frantically turn off the stove, pull the pan to the unlit burner, collect yourself, and say a prayer for your child left in the room. You call upon your best collection of skills as a parent. You say a prayer for yourself and ask God for wisdom. Your spouse walks in. What happened? Honey, you have no idea. Let me tell you. But first, you need to know it's been a tough day for our oldest. Parenting is difficult, even on the good days. Parenting is bound by the emotions of hope, worry, trust, and doubt. We hope our child has a good, successful life. We worry that their life may turn out otherwise. We trust them to make the right decisions. We worry they won't or that they'll be caught in a situation that tests their willpower and judgment. We trust that our efforts will be enough to guard them, keep them, and guide them throughout their lives. We doubt ourselves and our abilities. We want them to be with someone who is good for them and good to them. We doubt that out outcome when they're in a bad relationship. We want them to have a good career and not end up couch sur surfing, certainly not with us. We wonder if that's possible when calculus or the college class becomes a failing point or when their chosen trade hits a rough patch. We want them to draw close to God and keep faith for foremost, but struggle in prayer when they have little to do with God or the church. Hagar knows the struggles of parenting. Hers is a story of neglect and abuse bound by the burden of watching her own flesh and blood suffer. The Egyptian woman who would become enslaved to a Jewish forefather of our faith knows the struggle. Hagar cries out among the sands of desperation, not knowing whether anyone is listening. The single isolated parent, and parent is just trying to survive and give her child what he needs and deserves. We don't know for certain how Hagar came to reside in Abraham and Sarah's home. Some scholars suggest that Hagar may have been handed over to Abraham when he paid a rather unfortunate visit to Pharaoh. Abram, as he was known at the time, ventured into Egypt in hopes of surviving a famine, and he plays an old trick on Pharaoh. He tells his wife Sarah to tell folks that they were siblings rather than husband and wife. The deceit got Pharaoh in trouble with God and Abram in trouble with Pharaoh. To absolve himself of the matter, Pharaoh insists Abram leave town and send him packing with all of his possessions. While encamped in Egypt, Abram had done well for himself. He had acquired sheep, cattle, donkeys, and servants, men and women, and Hagar might have been one of them. Regardless of the backstory, Hagar lived in a foreigner's home. She was enveloped in a culture that was not her own, but that of her owners. Her job was to care for Sarah. Cleaning house, helping with baths, and preparing meals would have been the norm. But then comes the day when she's asked, or rather told, to do much more. She was to give herself to Abram. 
This was no ordinary family tree in the making. Abram had been promised by God that he would be the father of many people, the number of which would be as countless as the stars. How was Father Abraham to have many sons, and many sons have he if he didn't have the first? Still, we are rightfully disturbed by the expectation and the position of which Hagar is placed. We're offended. How dare they? But lest we forget, our culture is filled with ills and violence toward people too, and the culture of antiquity was different than that of our own. A woman's chief charge in those days was to provide children. If she couldn't, she bore the burden of securing an heir. That was her plight. Fertility treatments exist via modern medicine, and surrogate arrangements are formalized. Sarah and Hagar had the, had the fortune and luxury of neither. So ten years after Sarah feels she might be unable to conceive, she took her maidservant into her husband. Naturally, Hagar conceived. Jealousy grew in Sarah's heart. Parenting is ripe with challenges. Holding the desire to be a parent and being unable to do so leads to a gut-wrenching ache. We see families enjoying life together, and we wish we could have the same moments. We see parents giving their children second best, and we ask why them and not us. We struggle to bring a child into this world. Some are held briefly. Some are too tiny to be held. It's a daily struggle of grief that has no end of reminders. When Hagar became pregnant, Sarai felt judged. Hagar looked down upon her barren master. Sarai blames Abram, and Abram reminds his wife that Hagar is her servant and not his. Poor Hagar, a pawn being tossed around in someone else's scheme. Scripture says that Sarai then dealt harshly with Hagar, and I, I think that's a bit of a Sunday school answer. I think that's a simple statement that masks the truth of the pain that Hagar no doubt felt. I, I suspect that a pregnant Hagar had more chores and harder responsibilities. I, I suspect that Sarah yelled at her maidservant in fits of jealous rage. It was too much. Hagar fled. No known place to go. No provision. She just wanted out of that place, away from Sarah as far as she could get. So she ran and ran and ran until she slid up beside a stream, and that's when God first reached out to her. Go back. Go back, the angel said. Go back to whence you have trod. God will guard you and bless you. Whenever things look bleak, we need someone to help point the way. When the nights get long and sleepless, we need a rested night owl to hold and feed the crying child. When the diagnosis comes in, it's hard for both parents to remain strong every day, every moment. So they can take turns consoling one another throughout the journey. When the homework is a struggle, one parent has to figure out the study guide or recall the arithmetic from 8th and 10th grades, regardless of how many years have passed. When it's time for driving lessons, someone has to be patient or hire someone who is. When that first real relationship ends, someone has to be their shoulder. Life is filled with moments when the best we can do is sit alongside one small life-giving source, hoping it doesn't run dry and hoping someone comes along in those times of despair. Abram, Sarai, and Hagar make it past those early years in their initial family crisis. Ishmael reaches his teen years, and then Sarai learns that she is with child and will birth Isaac. Jealousy again grows in her heart. Sarah didn't want her son having to share the family's inheritance. She insists that Hagar and Ishmael be dismissed from the home. Abraham sends Hagar and his son packing, and they leave with nothing more than bread and water. I've sat with Hagar and Ishmael. They've carried different names, but the stories of their lives have had pain-written chapters also. Laura and Tim had two children, two, two children and chose a third. They loved all three of them dearly. They held them, rocked them, fed them, and taught them. They guided them through the twists and turns of life along with the love and support of older generations. Two boys and a girl they had, each the apple of their eyes, 
all three cherished, capable, and yet still fragile. Samuel had brains and athletic ability. He had been doted over from birth, and each of his accomplishments were celebrated. He felt the pressure to be normal and still excel. Eli enjoyed working with and learning from his father, uncles, and grandfather. He struggled to find his way among his peers. He remained pudgy long after others had grown tall and lean. Then people who had been pillars in his life died. Lisa faced her own struggles, including her perceived need to live up to her older brother's reputation and a terribly complex and overbooked schedule. When life hit, all three of them turned to a smoke or a drink of something to hide their feelings and dull the pains. With every sip, slug, and puff, they drown away their parents' hopes. Sure, they were surviving, but none of them, parents or children, were living. My prayers, along with others, joined the agony of their hearts. Eyes were opened, conversations were held. And after a couple of years, each of them had made peace with themselves, God and their parents. It wasn't a perfectly smooth transition. Bumps, bruises, and scrapes happened well past their childhood. But all of them found a way to move beyond the shade tree of pain and despair and into the light. We, we know what it's like to see a child struggle. The friends don't come easily or the friend betrays them. They're growing, but not as fast as their classmates. They're smart, funny, and cool, but someone else we think is smarter, cooler, or funnier. We've watched our child struggle with the growing pains of life. We've gone to doctor's appointments, waiting to bring them into the world. We've said goodbye to children we never held or held only for a brief while. We've made late-night trips to the store so that our children could have what they needed to complete the project. But like Hagar and Ishmael, we have neighbors who feel forgotten. They too struggle to feel known, seen, and loved. The ones who haven't given up hope cry out for help and for refuge. Others fall into the shadows. I wish I could end on a happy note. I wish I could deliver this message wrapped up all nice and neat where every child's life is full and complete and every parent feels pride and success. But we all know that that isn't true. Not every child is surrounded by love and support in the way that all God's creatures deserve. We're not naive to the proclivities of selfishness and pride. If parenting were easy and parents chose right and children did right, society would be different. If every professed Christian and every congregation were to do their part, lives would be changed and souls transformed. As it is, children are faced with home and family situations that cause them to face hardships of this world far quicker than God intended. Too many are left asking, like Hagar, if anyone is listening. In Rapids Parish, 555 children are in foster care because someone chose poorly or is accused of choosing poorly. In the state, more than 4,000 children are living away from their biological parents. It doesn't mean they aren't loved and cared for, but they are disconnected from their family. Like Hagar, they live somewhere other than the place and among the people who may be most familiar to them. Additionally, about 3,000 children, teenagers are in juvenile detention within the state. That's less than what it was 10 years ago when about 7,000 teens were in juvenile detention. The 2010 census showed that 16,900 couples were divorced or separated in Louisiana. Somewhere, children are bouncing between homes and navigating custody agreements, or they see one parent less or not at all. When the youth served at Manor House this summer, 18 children, from just old enough to eat a sandwich to older elementary, walked up to the window to get a, a sack lunch. Some came with families piled into a vehicle, some walked, some may have been in a home where someone just didn't feel like cooking that day, but in the end, each of them had a need. But all is not lost. 
the angels of God still come in our time of need for one and all, and they call upon our hearts. We know the impact of faith. We know the impact of the divine. The teaching and witness of Jesus and the Spirit of God upon people's hearts transforms and saves. We can be bound, challenged, encouraged, and supported through the ties of faith and family. The family that eats together talks. The family that plays together laughs. The family that prays together stays together. And that effort must be united. I am so grateful for the men who worship here and in other congregations too with their families. We men must not let the priority of faith fall upon mothers. A dad's faith practices far greater than mothers has a significant impact upon the child's life, whether they go to church or don't go to church. It's like a three-to-one odd kind of thing. A father's faith practice drastically increases the likelihood that their child will be involved in church as a child and as an adult. Regular participation in religious services and practices also are linked to better health, less stress, and a longer life. It's linked to stronger, healthier marriages and family relationships. And people of faith give and serve more. They help others to a greater percentage than people not of faith. I know as well as you that society and culture has and is changing rapidly. Some of you remember the first TV or radio that arrived in town. Many of you used a party line. Now most of us carry a screen that allows us to watch, call, or be contacted by someone as long as the battery is charged well enough and the signal strong enough. The developments of the technological age allows us to know what's going on anywhere in the world almost as quickly as it occurs. There's no shortage of information and events to process. But the true needs of people haven't changed. We need to be loved. We need to feel connected and in community. We need basic needs met. We need to feel like we're contributing in some way. And people need to know God. Even in Hagar's despair, as she and her son lay dying, she cried out for help. And God, our God, who has always loved children, answered her. God provided what both of them needed in the moment and for generations to come. It looked differently than what they may have wanted or expected, but it was what they needed. My parents often said, as I struggled to understand some decisions they made involving my younger sisters, Brandon, you'll never know what it's like until you've had one of your own. They were right, and at the same time, they weren't. Most parents' love for a child is so deep that they'll do anything to help. But sometimes the thing a child needs is the thing we find most difficult to provide. I've watched parents give and bend over backwards when their child needed some guidance and independence, not another handout. I've watched parents guard their child's life so closely that they didn't struggle. And because the runways of life had been cleared for them, the child struggled to stand on their own. They needed some space to fail so that they could learn to navigate life themselves. I've watched parents give their child so much independence that they're practically free ranged when the child needed some boundaries and rules. I've watched parents grieve the death of a child. I've watched parents fear for their child's life. I've known of parents receiving violence as a consequence of their child's addictions. With so many pressures facing us and our families, we sometimes lose sight of what children actually need. I've watched parents keep their child so busy and entertained that their child didn't know what to do when they had free time and life was less structured. So the, the question for us as a church, as a people of God, is what are we willing to do to parent others? You know better than I the history of this place. We have a pretty clear track record of standing in the gap and walking alongside parents and children. For nearly a quarter century, this church has hosted buddy camp. As the number of people in these pews has fluctuated, you have found a way to continue to love and to serve. It helps others feel known and loved. It helps parents breathe easy and rest easy. It provides an experience for others. 
Fostering communities called this church home until its workout grew the closet down the hall. That is part of their history and our contribution to their mission. Some of you are involved in CASA, intervening on behalf of a child. We minister to and alongside children and youth of our own, as well as friends and neighbors. Again, this year, for example, we will provide Christmas gifts for 90 children through the United Methodist Children's Home. So through a number of ministries and nonprofits, we have met people's needs directly and indirectly, personally, in relationship with, the, with them. And as the size of the congregation has increased and the, aver and the average age of the congregation has increased, we've struggled to sustain these ministries at the level we remember, yet we have continued to walk forward and pray faithfully. And we will continue to cry out, though we cannot let the memories of ministries and blessings define or limit our continued calling and work in our neighborhoods. I'm convinced that God has placed First Methodist Alexandria in this community for a very particular purpose, to be the shade tree and source of water for people. This congregation has a strong foundation and a clear legacy of standing in the gap to love and serve others. Along the way, as times have changed, we've we're, we've tried to maintain. We're trying to maintain these ministries that testify to God's love and our mission and callings bind us to dream new dreams for whatever it means to be the hands and feet of Christ in this fallen world. Even when we're tired and fewer in number, we don't give up. Even when the well run dry, we cry out for help. So what would it look like for First UMC to be known as the beacon of light and hope for families in our area. What would it take? What would we give up? What would we sacrifice? What and who would commit? And what would be the outcome? Amen. I'd like to thank Brandon for his preparation and meditating on such a difficult scripture, such a heavy scripture for us this weekend. Uh, thank you, Brandon. Um, thank you. We have a few announcements. Uh, in case you haven't heard, our church has a pumpkin patch, and we're going to be opening up soon. So if you're available this coming Friday at 5 p.m., we're going to be unloading the truck, if you're available for that. Um, and then... Daphne, Jean, and RL are going to prison, and they need cookies for that. Now, I know you're all very busy, but God knows you're busy too. So um, if you have time to help them out, there's very specific uh, guidelines for the cookies in order to bring them to prison for safety purposes. So um, make sure you look that up, what the guidelines are. And you can also, if you can't bake on your own, um, Miss Rhonda Atwood will be baking cookies on Monday, October 16th at 3 p.m. if you want to just come bake with her. Uh, the Bible study on Revelation is Wednesdays at 6. And lastly, if you would like to join this great congregation, you can come forward as we sing our closing song, and um, you can join us that way or after worship if you're shy. Did someone say my name? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Okay, so 6 p.m. on Friday, but the time will be TBA, okay? Um, that's what it sounds like to me, but we'd love to have your help for that. Many hands make light work. Our closing hymn today can be found in your black The Faith We Sing books, number 2172, We Are Called. That's number 2172. Please stand and join us.
Thanks again for being with us in worship today. Um, and now, dear friends, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, may we glow from this place knowing the warmth and love of being a beloved child of God in the family of God and being willing to spread that good news to all those in the world, both near and far. Go in peace.